following program is brought to you by Total Theater Online. The views expressed do not necessarily represent those of the staff or management of WGBB. You're listening to the station that serves your community, 1240 WGBB. And now it's time for Dave's Gone By with David Lefkowitz. Like two flamingos in a fruit fight. Every color of day. My fellow Americans, good evening and welcome to Dave's Gone By, an hour of talk radio, comedy, music and whatnot, coming to you live from succulent Miracle Island, the studios of WGBB, where of course there's technical chaos as always, sorry about the uh, late start. Actually, it's the studio of the station is in Merrick, the transmitter is in Freeport, and uh, the signal seems to be in Macedonia, but maybe you're hearing us, I hope so. Last week, I think it was our best show ever. We had the special Halloween edition. This pre-election program is going to be more political, which means it's even scarier. If you have young kids, you might want to keep them away from the radio for an hour. Not that we're doing anything offensive or FCC problematic, but this isn't a children's show. It's a show for grown-ups that makes them feel like children, which is what it's all about. On this program tonight, I promise you, my fellow Americans, the World Weird Web, which is a weekly segment devoted to wild and wacky pages on the Internet. Furthermore, and let me make this perfectly clear, I promise a cultural segment with a bunch of Broadway theater reviews. And if you choose to stay with me for the next 57 minutes, I promise you a comedy sketch, a comedy sketch for all Americans, black, white, yellow, red, and octoroon. Four score bars and seven minutes ago, I brought forth to this station a couple of CDs. Should you make the right choice, the only choice, and keep your dial at Dave's Gone By, I promise you songs by Cream, XTC, Billy Joel, and more. And so, my fellow radio listeners, I urge you to join me in this great work. Do not be misled or misguided by Top 40, by Easy Listening, by Around the Clock Sports, and by the weird guy who plays reggae from his house. With your help, I can and will bring this show to victory. But every great journey begins with one step. In my case, that's probably a step in poo. But the first step tonight is the news gone by, a look at events in the world around us from an impolite political perspective. November 5th, Tuesday, is Election Day across the country, with some fairly key races in states like New York and Florida. In a speech given October 29th, President George Bush urged everyone to get out and vote. He said, quote, It doesn't matter who you vote for. But I have a few suggestions. The audience laughed, disregarding the most obvious suggestion, a Florida recount. Greeted with mildly negative unemployment news on November 1st, Bush said, and this is a quote, Today, it looks like some more Americans are looking for work, and that's a problem. Well, with any luck, in exactly 23 months, George Bush will be looking for work, preferably as a pallbearer to his vice president and psychiatric nurse to his attorney general. On the local front, Governor George Pataki is seeking re-election. He's up against the seemingly stalled campaign of Democrat Carl McCall, as well as free-spending independent candidate Tom Golisano. Bringing out the big guns, McCall's team has begun airing TV commercials, showing party leader Bill Clinton stumping for their candidate. The move is significant, because it's the first time the former president has been on the giving end of lip service. McCall's record as controller and president of City Corps are worth debating, though for me, his Achilles heel is that he was president of the Board of Education in the early 1990s. Electing him on the basis of that is like making Osama bin Laden chief architect in rebuilding One World Trade Center. For his part, Golisano has been waging an all-out media war against Pataki, charging the two-time incumbent with financially two-timing New York State and being in the pocket of special interest groups and big businesses. Now, on the surface, Golisano seems like he's fighting the good fight against the political machine. But the last time I voted for someone who said he was the least of three evils, it was Ralph Nader, stealing votes from the Democrats and allowing George Bush to steal the White House. It's all in, <clears throat> pardon me, it's all well and good to say you don't work with special interest groups and you don't play ball with the powers that be. But what's a person like that doing in politics? It seems the only way to get anything done these days is to scratch the right back and grease the right palm. 
It worked in Nassau County for years until the Republicans got lazy and stupid. But I was digging Golisano's message until I got a letter in the mail this week, a plain white envelope that said on the front, quote, important tax-related document enclosed. Well, I opened the letter wondering if Angie M. Cullen was going to raise my school taxes this year, when what should I see but a form letter from Tom Golisano? reminding me that the Democrats just raised property taxes 19% and how dare they. Leaving aside the reason for the tax hike, a decade of neglect by the previous administration, that was a pretty sleazy trick to get me to read an advertisement that, I admit, I would have otherwise thrown away. If Golisano's people are willing to stoop to a cheap ploy like that just to get their message out, I wonder what they'll do when money's involved, or power. I really don't know enough about the issues to make any predictions or recommendations in local elections, but in the interest of fairness, I do have to air one political advertisement, FCC rules, so bear with me. Peter Byfield wants to be your state senator. A liberal Democrat, Peter Byfield wants you to believe that he's pro-family, anti-crime, and concerned about your health care and retirement plans. But did you know that Peter Byfield is a child molester? That he's been convicted three times and charged with 115 counts of sodomy and sexual assault on a minor? And the proof is in his record. Peter Byfield voted yes 31 times on a resolution to make four and a half the age of consent. Not six, four and a half. And when former Lieutenant Governor Tom Slavin was caught on camera buggering a farm animal, who was in the adjoining hotel room with a nine-year-old Vietnamese hooker? Peter Byfield. Are we really going to let Peter Byfield run our schools, our businesses, our Capizio stores? Can we really trust our state in the hands of a man whose fingers smell like fish and bubble gum? Peter Byfield is a sick, evil pervert, and anyone who votes for him should be shot on sight. Make the moral choice. Vote for Scott Wainwright because he's not a molester. Paid for by the committee to elect a non-molesting state senator. Okay, we're having some, some trouble. We were going to be playing some uh, cream music there, uh, which we're not playing at the moment because, of course, well, I hear some music in the background. I have no idea what it is. Along the Huangho Valley. What the heck is that? This is not really happening. I'm actually on uh, on WABC radio right now. This is all a dream. WGBB is it's like a stick in a forest here. Um, well, anyway, I'm going to continue with the news. In non-political news, a federal judge endorsed Microsoft and... Ma- bleh, a federal judge... I can take my time now because there's four and a half minutes of music that isn't going to be playing. A federal judge endorsed Microsoft's antitrust settlement deal with the Justice Department, allowing the software giant to make a few changes but still effectively function as a monopoly. Nine states are challenging this ruling, which is a far cry from the earlier decision by another judge to split Microsoft in half. Microsoft founder Bill Gates called the decision, quote, a good compromise and good settlement, whereas a competing software maker told the Associated Press, quote, there were no real remedies, no actual punishments. I'm not too surprised. In complying with the new rules, new computers installed with the operating system Microsoft XP will be able to run email and instant message systems by other software makers. Due to a coding glitch, however, emails sent via other systems are automatically translated into Swedish, and instant messages may take 48 to 72 hours to deliver. Microsoft has said it is working on the problem and should have it solved by early 2009. The next item comes from the syndicated Weird But True column published locally in the New York Post. An Illinois man, Everett Howes, was jealous of the attention his girlfriend was giving her dog. So, he stuffed the animal into her microwave oven and cooked it, placing the burnt remains of the dog in a bag on his girlfriend's porch. He's been arrested, although convicting him may be difficult. His girlfriend mistakenly ate the evidence, under the impression that it was, in fact, Korean takeout. 
In local news, congratulations to Kim Kong. I see my wife laughing in the control room in horror. In local news, congratulations to Kip Kong, the guy arrested for mailing insults and newspaper clippings to Lippa in a plain brown envelope. Newsday reports that the Nassau District's Attorney Office has asked the judge to dismiss the aggravated harassment charges. If you remember from our show two weeks ago, when Mr. Cohn was a calling guest, he was proud of his civil disobedience against the Long Island Power Authority, and he didn't regret the way he paid his bills every month. He'd include anti-LIPA messages and negative newspaper stories, and he would scroll, LIPA sucks, on the outside of the package. This time, an employee in the Keyspan mailroom freaked, called 911 because of 9-11, and that led to the arrest. Mr. Cohn's fight for a lower utility bill and for LIPA, which is essentially a monopoly, to stop spending so much money on advertising hit home with Long Islanders. A Newsday poll gave him a 97% approval rating, and even LIPA chairman, oh, I'm, I'm getting news here that it's LIPA, LIPA chairman Richard Kessel called uh, Cohn to apologize for the overreaction. When I spoke to Mr. Cohn on the October 20th show, I asked him to state his piece, to say wh exactly what his problem was with LIPA. And this was his response. Uh, they could reduce everybody's rates. I mean, you know, uh, we've paved the shore, I don't know how many times. We're getting hit with another 3 to cent surcharge to pay back taxes to LIPA, I believe, for stuff that was overcharged, you know, during this whole shore mess. Um, you know, our government officials gave us permission to build that plant, and, you know, they charge us to build it, charge us to tear it down, charge us to close it. You know, I mean, we've been paying for this thing for 20 years and haven't benefited from it yet. Hmm. Well, um, so... You know, the other yeah, thing is the, the advertising that they do. It's not like we do have a choice. You know, it's basically lipo and nobody. Um, so to advertise is pretty fruitless, I would think, except the fact that it's wasting a lot of ratepayers' money. But do you really think, and I think I asked you this when we spoke on Friday, that even if they stop the advertising, that's going to make a dent? Uh, do I think it'll get kicked back to the ratepayers? Well, I'd like to think so, but I, I'd have to see it happen first. Um, oh, my engineer has a, a cool question. Do you think we were better off when we had Lil Co instead of Lippa? Uh, it was uh, one evil against the next, you know. <laughs> well, one evil against another. Basically the motif of Election Day these days. Anyway, congrats again to Kip Kong on the good news of the charge most likely being dismissed. Not so much because he was right, but because he was on my show. In regional news, the California Milk Processors Board has been offering big money and tourism deals to any town in the state that officially changes its name to Got Milk. The City Council of Biggs, California, population 1,793, is actually considering the proposal. The Associated Press reports that many residents in Biggs, which is an hour from Sacramento and has a road sign that asks, Got Tractors, fears that changing the town's name to Got Milk will make them a laughingstock. And no, this is not the first time a Berg has changed its name for Bucks. This is not a joke. In 2000, Halfway Oregon changed its name to Half.com Oregon for one year. The town got about a hundred grand and a bunch of computers for doing it. The worry, of course, is that this kind of commercialism could lead to abuse. Or such places on the map as Fresh and Feminine New Jersey, I've Fallen and I Can't Get Up Florida, and Gee, Your Hair Smells Terrific North Dakota. Meanwhile, the Got Milk promotion is celebrating its 10th anniversary and continues to spawn imitators. A campaign to help the Virginia farm industry, Got Manure, came to a halt recently when Tony Randall, Spike Lee, and actress Terry Hatcher all refused to wear the mustache. Moving to the obituary column, the... I just got hit by my wife. The L.A. Times reported that gay activist, activist Harry Hay died at age 90 of lung cancer on October 17th. In lectures and essays, Hay chronicled his transition from a married man in the 1940s to helping found the Gay Rights Magazine Society a decade later. The unusual part of the story is that in 1935, Mr. Hay and his friend, actor Will Gear, later in the Waltons, both joined the Communist Party. The only problem was that the Communist Party banned homosexuals.
Hay quit the party in 1951, but was still called to testify by the House Un-American Activities Committee in 1955. In retrospect, Mr. Hay's great cultural contribution was not so much encouraging gay rights, but in proving one could belong to two completely paradoxical establishments at the same time. A debt is therefore owed Mr. Hay by such organizations as Jews for Jesus, the Staten Island Fresh Air Fund, and the Muslim Society for the Promotion of Pork. In Music News of the Week, Jason Jam Master J. Mizell, DJ for the group Run DMC, didn't run fast enough from a bullet fired at his head October 30th. The 37-year-old rap artist died, and police are still trying to figure out whether gang violence or East Coast-West Coast rivalries were involved. Officials say the saddest part of the killing is that, once again, a creative artist has been murdered while Yoko Ono escapes unharmed. Predictably, other rap stars have banded together to record a tribute album to Jam Master J, commemorating his contribution to gangster rap and hip-hop. Artists paying heartfelt, respectful tribute on the new CD will include Dr. Dre with Splatter Your Face All Over the Place, DMX with Rest in Peace, Your Wife is in Good Hands, and the emotional, loving ballad from Big Daddy Kane, Baggot Faggot, Here Come the Maggots. As an extra tribute to Mizell's legacy, a black and white sticker that reads, Warning, explicit content will be printed on the side of his coffin. On the medical front, Newsday reports that for the first time in 11 years, syphilis rates increased in the United States. The numbers were significantly down for women and African Americans, but up sharply, bleh, but up sharply for whites and Hispanic gay men. In other news, Tommy Toon and Ricky Martin both returned to New York recently to jumpstart their recording careers. That's the news gone by for pre-election week November 3rd, 2002, even though our election process is fatally flawed, and the 2000 presidential elections gave a lie to the rumor that people have the power, you should still get out and vote. If you hate everybody on the ticket, go in the booth. Don't pick anybody and go back out again. Or put down Abraham Lincoln as a write-in. Just because we've been counted out doesn't mean we can't be counted. Oh, and a public service reminder to WGBB's many Chinese listeners. It's election with an L. Please don't do anything illegal. Send in your comments, opinions, and hanging <laughs> chance. <laughs> Sorry about that. Two days gone by. P.O. Box 62, Hewlett, New York, 11557-0062. Or email us at davesgoneby at AOL.com. I can't believe the phones are not lighting up with, with uh, hate mail, as phones tend to do with hate mail. Unless otherwise requesting all comments and questions may be read on the air, name withheld upon request. That's davesgoneby at AOL.com. Or snail mail, box 62, Hewlett, New York, 11557-0062. Uh, Vote with your head, not over it. I think we're doing a live commercial, or maybe we're going... No, we're doing a... Hi, folks. Yeah, Dave Lefkowitz here from Dave's Gone By, and I want to tell you about a product, event, or service. I'm going to talk about it for half a minute or a minute. I'm going to make it really interesting, and all my listeners are going to go, hey... Maybe I'll try this product, event, or service. It's called advertising or sponsorship, and it's easy, cost-effective, and just plain effective. To get your person, place, or thing, well, not thing, promoted on Dave's Gone By and reach listeners all over Brooklyn, Queens, Long Island, and the Tri-State area, just give us a call at 516-295-1511 or email us at davesgoneby at aol.com. Check our website, hometown.aol.com forward slash Dave's Gone By and see sponsorship opportunities, ad rates, and more. Again, the number, 516-295-1511. Insert your product, event, or service here. I want to give a plug to Don Lewis, host of another show on this radio station, Entertainment Long Island, Sunday nights at 10. It's an hour of interviews and advice about how to get started as a performer, be it for business or a hobby. Every show has trivia questions, live music by Eddie Hug and the Moonshiners, giveaways, and Don's a real pro. He puts on a good show. So give a listen to Entertainment Long Island, 10 p.m. Sundays, right before my show on WGBB, because the stage is a world of entertainment. 
Now that Halloween is out of the way, the Christmas marketing blitz has begun. TV commercials, shopping malls, greeting card stores, they're all gearing up for a holiday still two months away. Of course, that's because a season that should be about belief and kindness and gratitude has simply turned into a commercial shopping spree. We're too busy opening presents to be present. We're so busy spending, we're spent. It reminds me of, one of the uh, great story by Shel Silverstein, The Giving Tree, one of the more beloved fables for adults and children. As I'm sure you all remember, it's the tale of a little boy and a tree, and all the gifts that the tree, freely and unselfishly, lavishes on the kid. And it's a rather enigmatic story, because you're not sure whether the tree is being Jesus-like in his love and sacrifice, or too masochistic, or a little of both. The Giving Tree was published in 1964, and what's exciting is that recently an earlier draft of the book has been discovered among Silverstein's archives. Hard as it is to believe, the two characters in the story weren't always a boy and a tree. On the first few pages of the author's notebook, you can see such crossed-out titles as The Giving River, The Gift of the Goat, and The Generous Puppy. But he went as far as a full draft of another version before settling on the giving tree that we all know and love, titled The Giving Chimp. This variant lacks some of the poetry of the finished fable, but the template is there, and it's certainly less ambivalent about its central relationship. So, I'm very proud to share with you now, for the first time anywhere, a fable for the ages, Shel Silverstein's The Giving Chimp. Once there was a chimpanzee, and he loved a little boy. And every day, the boy would come to the forest, and he'd frolic with the monkey. He'd play king of the jungle, and the monkey would be his most loyal subject. The little boy would pet the monkey's fur, and share bananas with him. And they would play hide and seek. And when they were tired, they'd curl up together and nap in the noonday sun. And the boy loved the monkey very much, and the chimp was happy. But time went by, and the boy grew older, and he didn't come to play as much. Then, one day, the boy came to the forest, and the chimp said, Come, boy, want to play monkey see, monkey do? I'll be monkey. I'm too old to play silly games, said the boy. I want to buy things, show off at school. Can you give me stuff? I'm sorry, said the chimp. I have no money, nor any objects of value. Why don't you shave off my fur? I'm sure you can sell it in the city for a good price. And so, the boy got out his pocket knife, shaved the monkey's fur, and carried it away. And the chimp was chilly, but happy. But the boy stayed away for a long time, and the chimp grew sad. And then one day, the boy came back, and the chimp danced and screamed with joy and masturbated. Come, boy, the chimp then said. Let's pick berries together like the old times. I am too busy for berry picking, said the boy. I have a wife and children. We need a house to keep us warm. Can you give us that? I have no house, said the chimp. The forest is my house, but I can help you. Take my paws. They are considered rare and valuable in the art field. So, the boy cut off the monkey's four paws and carried them away to sell. And the chimp was crippled, but happy. But the boy stayed away for a long time. And when he came back, the chimp was so happy he clapped his stumps with delight. Come, boy, he giggled, come and play. I am too old and sad to play, said the boy. My wife is ugly, and my restaurant is failing. Why was I born? Take my eyes, said the chimp. Laboratories can use them for testing makeup to make your wife pretty again. And take a piece of my brain, bring it to your restaurant, and serve it raw on a bed of lettuce. Foreign businessmen will pay dearly for the delicacy. So. The boy took his rusty penknife and gouged out the monkey's eyes. Then he held the monkey down, 
pried open his skull and scooped out a good portion of the chimp's brain. And he left the forest. And the chimp was happy, but not really. And after a long time, the boy came back again. Why you want now? said the chimp. My ass? My restaurant is gone, said the boy. Keep your ass. Is your wife sick? said the chimp. You can crush my liver with some herbs and make some medicine. Don't bother, said the boy. She died two years ago. We could play together in a forest like the old days. I am too old and weak, said the boy, and I have no spirit for it. I am sorry, sighed the chimp. I wish I could give you something, but I have nothing left. I don't need very much now, said the boy. I am very tired, and I wish I were dead. No problem, said the chimp, who leapt at the boy's throat and tore into it with his razor-sharp teeth. Then he jammed his tail down the boy's windpipe until he began to choke and turn blue. Pretty soon, the boy turned pale white. His face went rigid, his eyes wide open, his mouth agape, his arms hanging loosely at his sides. The monkey pulled his tail out of the boy's throat and used it to close the boy's mouth. Then the chimp gently used his old stumps to close the boy's eyelids. You rest now, said the chimp. Sit and rest. And the boy did. And the chimp was happy. Broadway. Off-Broadway. Cabaret. These are magical words conjuring up a universe of great entertainment. If you want to know everything about what's happening on the stages of New York, you need to get Performing Arts Insider magazine. For 60 years, Performing Arts Insider has been a bible of the industry. It tells you when shows are opening and closing, what they're about, who's in the cast, designers, writers, composers, contacts for producers and managers, box office info, parental guides, everything you need to know if you care about theater, opera, and dance, too. As the chief editor of Backstage put it, Performing Arts Insider is who, what, where, and when, all the facts at your fingertips. For more information, how to subscribe or get a sample issue, call 516-295-1511 or go to www.totaltheater.com and click on Performing Arts Insider. Okay, well, welcome back to Dave's Gone By. It's about 11.34, and time for a segment I like to call Dave's Gone Cultural, featuring reviews, previews, and interviews about the arts. This week, I'm catching up on a bunch of new Broadway shows, so if you're wondering what to see and what to avoid, definitely stick around. First off, I'm already a bit glum about the closing of a show called Amour, a small, sweet little musical adapted from a French play, Amour featured music by Michel Legrand, best known for writing The Windmills of Your Mind and the film score for The Umbrellas of Cherbourg. In Amour, Malcolm Getz played Monsieur du Soleil, a meek, very conformist nobody, who suddenly gains the ability to walk through walls and doors as if he were invisible. He soon, soon transformed into a Robin Hood type, giving to the poor and risking everything to win the heart of a young woman married to a corrupt official. Some critics complained that Amour was very slight, and that the lyrics sometimes went overboard on cutesy rhymes, sounding more like Dr. Seuss than Dr. Freud. But I found Amour charming, very diverting, the score pleasant and the cast a pleasure. Malcolm Getz made an ingratiating every man turned icon, and Melissa Errico as the object of Du Soleil's affections proved again to be a captivating songbird. She's just a gorgeous singer. In fact, that's what struck me most about the show, how many lovely and distinctive voices there were in it, from Norm Lewis crooning ballads to Sarah Litzinger stealing the show as a girl hilariously throwing herself at the now-famous hero. But I won't say more about Amour, because, alas, it closed a couple of hours ago, just two weeks after it opened. The critics spent so much ink worrying whether audiences would find the uh, material slight and too European, the audiences listened, and it became a self-fulfilling prophecy, and everybody stayed away. Too bad. It was a sweet little bauble, and the voices were choice. 
Well, I had a more mixed response to Flower Drum Song, a revival of the uh, 1958 musical by uh, Richard Rogers, Oscar Hammerstein II, and uh, co-book and lyric writer Joseph Fields. Now, the original featured folks like Pat Suzuki, Miyoshi Umeki, Larry Blyden, if you remember him from game shows, and Jack Sue, you'll remember him from Barney Miller. The new version, and I guess they felt they needed a new version because the old one was probably a little stale, maybe a little racist and kind of contrived, was, is by David Henry Wang, who wrote the uh, wonderful play M. Butterfly, and it's been directed and choreographed by Robert Longbottom. Well, so Flower Drum Song wasn't prime R&H to begin with. I never saw the original, I never even saw the film, but... it did seem kind of convoluted when I read the synopsis. Now they have a new plot where the girl escapes from communist China. She takes refuge at this dilapidated Chinese opera house. It's financially failing. So the owner's son uses Friday nights for a risque, self-mocking nightclub show. Now, that show is what takes off and essentially saves the theater. And um, there's an intentionally tacky second act opening uh opening number that's set in the nightclub, which is fun, but also makes you wonder who they're doing it for, because it certainly makes this particular revival not quite appropriate for children. Um, And I felt that way about a lot of Flower Drum Song. It's okay, it's enjoyable, certainly the score is tuneful, although second tier, and yet it's also kind of bland, and you kind of wonder where they were going with it. Leah Salonga doesn't fade into the woodwork, but she doesn't shine brighter than the marquee bulbs either. And it's also, there, there's some plot problems, like um, it's hard to believe that the father, who's so steeped in tradition, suddenly does literally a 180-degree about-face and becomes totally into this new nightclub thing. I just you know, didn't buy it the way it was written. And it also weakens the central conflict in the story between father and son. Anyway, there are still the songs, including I Enjoy Being a Girl, I Am Going to Like It Here, and... The great You Are Beautiful. This is from the original.
entertaining, tuneful, better than most new musicals out there. Flower Drum Song still strikes me as a wee bit wilted. For all David Henry Wang's good work on the book, there's still kind of a who-cares aspect to all the plot machinations, especially since it leads up to a pretty contrived last-minute will-she-or-won't-she showdown. Still, uh, it's an old-fashioned, enjoyable entertainment especially when compared to a newfound, newfangled musical like Moving Out, which is directed and choreographed by dance semi-legend Twyla Tharp. Now, basically what she does here is cobbles together about two dozen Billy Joel songs and tells an interweaving story of characters who grow up in the 50s, fall in love, fall out of love, uh, then the men get sent off to war, one guy dies, one guy goes a little nuts, they all try to put their lives back together, and then move on into the 1980s. Which is a good idea for a show, but what you have in Moving Out, in my opinion, is really just two Billy Joel songs that are elaborated in that way. And all the stories in the show are basically told in scenes from an Italian restaurant and Goodnight Saigon, two good story songs with good story ideas that are acted out and danced out. It's a, the musical uh, has almost no dialogue, dialogue in it at all. It's all dance to uh, Joel songs. But it doesn't need all those other Joel songs filling everything out to an hour and 45 minutes because it's just a lot of repetition of boy meets girl, boy spins girl, boy loves girl, boy loses girl, boy spins other girl over and over again like a low-rent contact. And leaving the show, I felt if I saw one more person twirling on West 46th Street, I would really, really have to shoot them. Now, the, the Vietnam stuff is the best thing in the show, and the way memories haunt the characters is very clearly shown. Um, but then again, it's hard enough to keep Brenda and Eddie straight, and then you throw in all these other characters we're supposed to care about and don't, and it all becomes very generic. Young people fool around, grow up, go to war, get traumatized, killed, readjust. It, many moments are effective in a large metaphorical kind of a way, but in scene to scene storytelling, the show is just kind of repetitious and empty. And what's even weirder is they use a Billy Joel sound alike. There's a live guy on stage, Michael Cavanaugh, very talented, sounds like Billy Joel, and his voice holds out song after song after song. And I guess there's more energy having someone doing them live, but I still don't know why they just didn't use the actual songs. Um, bizarre. And in telling the story, Twyla Tharp crams in all these hits. Some of the connections are me memorable, like the song Big Shot is done between a sparring couple or the uh, rather poignant reconciliations that they do during I've Loved These Days. But there's still way too much of We're Young, It's the 1950s, Let's Dance and Horse Around in song after song, including this one, which is nonetheless one of the prettiest songs in Billy Joel's canon. I think the lyrics are a little too eager to impress, but this was Joel pre-superstar when he was still singing from a genuine place that wasn't the Betty Ford Clinic. So here's not Michael Cavanaugh, but Billy Joel from the Turnstiles album Summer Highland Falls.
Billy Joel, Summer Highland Falls, one of a couple dozen songs covered in Moving Out, a fitfully gripping but not quite recommended new musical on Broadway at the Richard Rogers Theaters, Richard Rogers Theater, only one of them, two and a half stars on that one from me, three stars for Flower Drum Song at the Virginia Theater, which is tuneful, amusing, thought-provoking, but somewhat underwhelming still. A couple of quick off-Broadway recommendations. Hopefully I'll be able to speak more about them uh, in future shows. The Water Coolers, a satirical musical review about stress in the modern workplace, is generally smart and savvy with a second act that goes deeper than the first. It's like Menopause the Musical with a brain and a much more professional cast. Three stars for The Water Coolers playing at a midtown supper club called Dillon's. And a nod to the autobiographical musical Betty Rules, rocking out at the Zipper Theater on West 37th Street. Betty is the name of a real-life female rock trio and have been trying to hit the big time for 17 years. Their ups and downs, their music, and their lifestyle choices are all out there, right in your face, by turns funny, poignant, loud, and clear. Staged by Michael Reif, the guy who directed Rent, Betty Rules moves rapidly, stays engaging all the way through, three stars for three wannabe stars. And that's Dave's Gone Cultural for this week. If you agree or disagree about these shows, or you want to weigh in on other shows or movies you've seen, you know the email, Dave's Gone By at AOL.com. No apostrophe, Dave's Gone By at AOL.com. Start spreading the news. There's a new magazine in town with the latest stories and reviews about everything on stage. On and Off Magazine. It's a glossy, full color guide to theater, dance, comedy, and cabaret in New York City. And the best part? It's free! You can find On and Off around town at theaters, restaurants, hotels, and community and information centers. Visit www.onandoffstage.com for more information, and let On and Off be your guide. Well, just skipping around to some of the segments we're going to do today, and on Dave's Gone By, where we vote early and often, time for our popular weekly segment, World Weird Web, a look at odd and unusual sites on the Internet worth your time and attention. Tonight, it's only fitting to be politically direct and scope out sites just right for Election Day. And what could be more apt, especially since we already had one chimp on this show, to laugh at another? America, still a somewhat free country, allows us to poke fun at our leaders, and what better way than at www.bushorchimp.com. Dot com. That's bushardchimp.com. What's it about? Just what it says. No heavy politics here, no right-wing bashing by the liberal left, just the really weird coincidence that George W. Bush often looks like, poses like, and gestures like a monkey. Bush or Chimp website founder B- Bill Felsbar writes on the homepage, I'm not a member of any political party, and I have nothing in particular against the man. I just think he kind of looks like a chimpanzee. To prove it, Feldspar put up a bunch of pictures side by side, the president on the left, an ape on the right. And damned if more often than not, Bush and chimp really do have a separated at birth quality. Oh, sure, the chimps have more hair. And sometimes Feldspar cheats, using a cartoon or a stuffed Curious George doll instead of a bona fide Jane Goodall grade gorilla. But political parties aside, the resemblances are uncanny, the results hysterical. A lot less funny are two sites that fall into the whatever happened to category. Two fringe politicians who seemed to be making a go of it a decade ago until the public wised up and realized they belonged in the bug house rather than the White House. The scariest one is former Klansman David Duke, who spent much of the 1980s and 90s running for political office, everything from governorships to the presidency, and he actually made the Louisiana State House of Representatives in 1989. Each time he'd make a run for local office, Duke would modify his message and drop the obvious hate speech, and each time he'd lose, he'd find another platform to rail about white power, Jewish and black degeneracy, and the genocidal horrors of Zionism. You can see all that and more at Duke's official website. It's at three different URLs, all the same, www.daviddukeduke.com, davidduke.org, and www.duke.org. And read such enlightening articles as, quote, Is Russia the key to white survival? Here's an excerpt. In Russia, over the past few weeks, I have met with the leaders of the white patriotic movements there, 
I have met with members of the Russian Duma, Congress, and many public officials who openly speak about Zionism and the need for white people around the world to defend our heritage. In my opinion, Russia and other Eastern countries have the greatest chance of having racially aware parties achieve political power. Russia has an economy that has been plundered by the Jewish oligarchs and organized crime fighters. Many Russians have urged me to get my new book on Jewish supremacism into the hands of the Russian people. End quote. Gee, Mr. Duke, why bother when they can just read your garbage for free on the website? Anyway, the best URL is www.daviddukenet, which automatically brings you to the online store. You can buy videos, clothing with a Celtic cross and a circle, Confederate flags, of course, a soft drink can foam huggy that reads David Duke, U.S. Senate, equal rights for all, and my favorite, historical swords and daggers. I'm not kidding. Filmmaker Michael Moore is so worried about right-wing lunatics having guns, he should get a look at the arsenal on davidduke.net. Hamlet could have kicked Laertes' ass if he had one of these. But please note, the Gladiator 2 sword list price $135 is sold out. I'm sorry. Just a tiny bit to the left of Duke, we come to Lyndon LaRouche. Oh yeah, him. The scariest thing about his website is the URL, www.larouche2004.net. I can't make head or tail of his economic theory, but his railings against the Anti-Defamation League have a familiar ring, as does his disgust over, quote, Nazi atrocities of Israeli Prime Minister Ariel Sharon and the utopian lunatics in the Israeli Defense Forces. But wait, anti-Semitism aside, let's not discount the possibility that he really is a brilliant economist. Here's a segment of his financial plan, readable in full on his website. Now, pay attention, it gets a teeny bit complicated. Quote, the American system of political economy, as, for example, described by Treasury Secretary Hamilton, is a typification of the voluntarist conception of the economic and related role of the individual in history, the agopic devotion to the furtherance of the common good. This anti-Hobbesian, anti-Lockean, anti-physiocratic conception of the individual is at the core of what is rightly recognized as the American intellectual tradition of Franklin, Lincoln, etc., on that account, accepting cases such as Austria's great reformer, Joseph II, that American intellectual tradition was hated bitterly by the Central European and Iberian Peninsula circles around the Habsburgs, including, of course, the Holy Alliance's Prince Metternich, and including degenerates such as the Carlists associated with the influence of the notorious Buckley family's influence inside the USA today. End quote. Well, gee, when you put it that way... I guess the reason for the website is you can't put footnotes on 30-second infomercials. So, when you go to the polls in 2004, just remember Leibniz's basic principles of calculus and Bernhard Riemann's conceptual approach to mathematical physics, and the reasons to vote for LaRouche become eminently clear. Me? I still think we should have voted for the pig for president run by the Chicago 7 in 1968, if only to hear Henry Kissinger tell him, That'll do, pig. That'll do. As for now, let's keep tabs on the lunatics and leaders. Check the websites davidduke.org and larouchein2004.net just to make sure they're not releasing sarin gas anywhere. And give bushorchimp.com a look. See if you don't find yourself saying, You maniacs! You blew it up! Oh, damn you all to hell! Then again, if Duke or LaRouche or Bush and company get reelected, some space aliens might be saying that about us in 2004, tangled as we are in the world weird web. Moving on to start spreading the news again. There's a new magazine in town with the latest stories and reviews about everything on stage. My God, they're getting a second act for free on, the, on this show. On and Off Magazine, a glossy, full-color guide to theater, dance, comedy, and cabaret in New York City. The best part is, it's free. You can find On and Off around town at theaters, restaurants, hotels, and community and information centers. Visit www.onandoffstage.com for more information, and let On and Off be your guide. Well. <laughs> okay. Just, yeah, keep it going. I'm, you know what? This is Dave Lefkowitz from Dave's Gone By. I want to tell you about a product, event, or service. 
I'm going to talk about it for half a minute or a minute. I'm going to make it really interesting, and all my listeners are going to go, hey, maybe I'll try this product, event, or service. Meanwhile, my engineer is going to get the XTC song ready, isn't he? Um, anyway, I'm talking about advertising or sponsorship, and it's easy, cost-effective, and just plain effective. To get your person, place, or thing... Well, not thing, promoted on Dave's Gone By, and reach listeners all over Brooklyn, Queens, Long Island, and the Tri-State area. Just give us a call at 516-295-1511, or email us at davesgoneby at aol.com. Check our website, hometown.aol.com forward slash davesgoneby, and see sponsorship opportunities, ad rates, and more. Again, the number 516-295-1511. Insert your product, event, or service here. Here's XTC. All right, check our website, hometown.aol.com. Dave's gone by to see a playlist for the music on this show and previous programs, plus all sorts of information about Dave's gone by. Learn about the Bystanders Club, advertising, sponsorship, how you can help support the program. We accept check, money order, PayPal, and absentee ballots. Thank you, Station Manager Joey, Mazel Tov on the Grandchild, Engineer Paul, uh, sorry about all the horrible technical difficulties that uh, GBB is always prone to. This has got to stop. Anyway, thank you, Don Lewis, host of the Entertainment Long Island Show, 10 o'clock Sunday nights, just before my show. Thanks to the press agents helping me cover theater, and my assistant and wife, Joyce Weil. Please send your comments, mudslinging, and suggestions to davesgoneby at AOL.com. Tune in next Sunday, same time, same place, same voice, same face. Have a great week. Vote your conscience. Don't miss your days going by. This is Dave Lefkowitz. Good night, and God bless. Good morning, America. How are you? And God bye. You've been listening to Dave's Gone By with David Lefkowitz on 1240 WGBB, the station that serves your community.